Would you like a treat? This is Sadie. Sadie is not happy. She wants to be off my lap, but she will bark a lot. So this is going to stop her from barking. This is Sadie's roadmap to success. Um, Sadie basically, um, she thinks, I, I believe she thinks she's in charge of the world. She really doesn't have a lot of rules. Um, she doesn't have a lot of structure. Um, she has some structure, but uh, she's able to, like, she gets petted so often, she doesn't even have to ask for it. And so I kind of consider uh, rules as kind of a way for us to act like leaders and demonstrate our leadership by enforcing the rules consistently. Like I talked about in the other video, dogs go through consistency, repetition, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward a dog, but you have to consistently do that. The dog's gonna come back, probe here, oh, you said no. Okay, let me come back an hour later, Try probe, oh, you said no. Come back the next day, probe, you said no. After enough probes, the dog's like, okay, so I'm not allowed to do that. Most of us are very inconsistent and that confuses the dog. Um, like uh, one of the rules we talked about is not laying the dog in the furniture. We do that because for dogs, the higher they sit or uh, more rank or authority they have. I'm not saying dogs can't be on the furniture, but if a dog does not listen to you, respect you, or has some of the attributes that she has, removing a privileged position like the height of being on the furniture is a great way to have the dog see a literal distinction where the humans are up here and the dog is down there. So I see them as having more rank or status than I do. But it's really important that everybody in the house is on the same page. If one of the guards enforces and the other one doesn't, it's the same thing. I would go ask my mom, hey mom, can I spend the night at Adrian's? Says, no, your Uncle Ray's coming tonight. Yeah, you can do another night. Hey dad, can I spend the night at Adrian's? Sure. After a while, my dad got smart and he said, what did your mother say? Um, but dogs are going to kind of sample and try to get that. If one person is, quote unquote, the bad guy, the other one isn't uh, paying attention, well, the dog's going to just go to the one that isn't paying attention and get what they want. And so what we want to do is, I don't say a boot camp, but we want to put her in a position where she sees the humans acting like leaders and help her practice acting like a follower to remove the burden of responsibility that is essentially on her shoulders. She thinks she's in charge of people walking by outside, dogs that might come by, guests that come by, uh, and everything is, is, is hers to stress about. So if we start enforcing rules, rules are a wonderful way for us to start acting like leaders because we're the ones enforcing it. A long time, I learned a long time ago as a dog behaviorist that dogs outlast each other. That's one of the ways they communicate how serious they are about it. If I'm a dog and I want her to do something, I'm willing to give up everything and drop everything I'm doing and follow her until I get my way. Now, that doesn't work with our lifestyles and that's when people throw their hands up, like, I don't have time to do that forever. I'm not saying forever. If you spend two to three months doing that, then you can kind of back off on being so diligent and the dog is in a new behavior pattern or habit of continuing to do that. So some of the rules we talked about, uh, well, first thing we talked about is a little exercise. Yes, you need a little exercise. She's not a super high energy dog, but she could use a little bit more exercise. I know I'm looking, that doesn't look super comfy, but you gotta stay in the shot because otherwise you're gonna bark the whole time. All right, so uh, the first thing we talked about was exercise. And for dogs, uh, most dogs need about an hour's worth of exercise. Being a Chihuahua, she probably doesn't need that much exercise, but right now just one walk a day is probably not gonna be sufficient. And we, uh, the guardian's gonna have uh, a, a procedure done and that's gonna be walking hard. Um, also, it's Nebraska. It's either, right now I'm looking outside, it looks like it's 93 degrees outside. And this is at five o'clock at night. So, uh, or ice storms, you're not gonna wanna do that. So one of the things that I want the guardian to do is start doing a doggy Stairmaster. Now we have a split level house, so you can. I would start off by just through, showing the have a treat, throw it to the bottom of the stairs while she's looking. When she goes down, it runs down, licks it up, come up with a funny word that means go down south, call it like Mexico. Call her back up, give her another treat, and call this one Canada or North Pole or something like that. So the first, so with an empty stomach, we run her up and down the stairs, back and forth, back and forth, until she's like, you're crazy. I've been down there 12, you know, 19 times. I'm not going down there anymore. I'm guessing her number's probably gonna be somewhere between 10 and 20. Uh, once we know her maximum number, then we can exercise her about 50 to 75% of that maximum number multiple times a day. Yeah, I know, it's tough. It's tough being a chihuahua. Um, and so uh, exercise for dogs is best done every two to four hours. So if we can figure this out, two or three, it's probably going to take two or three minutes per exercise session. So if we do that maybe four times a day and we supplement it with a walk, now we've depleted her energy. And most dogs that are, uh, if they have behavior problems, depleting their energy sets them up for success. So if you have some guests that are going to come over, make sure you exercise her and give her, she needs at least 10 minutes to recover before, between the time the exercise ends and before there's a knock at the door. So otherwise she's gonna be worse if you don't get her that break. So somebody texts you help, come over, your neighbors, hey, I'm bringing you some cookies in 15 minutes, cool. Go to the stairs and spend three minutes on doing the stairs. She has 12, 13 minutes to calm down. When the guest comes over, she's gonna be much more relaxed. Remind me, because we wanna go over how we can have some guests go over and help her start feeling better about them. 
Um, okay. So um, now uh, it is split level. So the other option you could do is just show Shori. I would first practice her having her go down the first flight of stairs. Then once she's pretty much going down there, throw the first one down there. Right when she licks it up, show her that she has, you have another one and drop it off the next flight of stairs. And she goes to, all the way down. Or you can have your partner down there calling the dog. And when it goes down there, you would give it another command that means all the way down the stairs. So maybe you call this one Mexico and call that one Peru. Uh, all the way, you know, half flight is Mexico, full flight is Peru. Um, all right, so exercise, another one that you can do is scent games. Let's say this is the post of a chair and the dog's outside. I just take one treat and put it right here behind the post of the chair. She comes in, she's like, I smell chicken liver. Yeah, do you smell chicken liver too? And then she looks around, her nose, it's very stimulating, it's very enriching. As soon as she finds it, every time she licks it up, come, with, come up with a funny command word that means to search. I say hunt, some people will say search, find, rescue, whatever the word is you want to, you know, adventure, you can say whatever word you want. After a while, you say it every time she licks up the treat. After a while, you say, you know, treasure, and she, oh, this is a fun game, and I'm going to run around the house. She also is going to feel better about herself as she earns that affection as opposed to being given that, uh, treats for no reason. And it's very stimulating for them as well, and it can be a good way to burn energy even though they're not super active doing it because they're using a different muscle, this one. All right, um, we also talked about enforcing rules consistently so the dog starts seeing us acting like leaders. We talked already about uh, no furniture. I would recommend you get X mats for the furniture. X mats are little plastic things. You got uh, the letter X and ATS. Uh, you can get them on Chewy or Amazon for about 11 to 13 bucks a piece. So I would get one, two, three, four, five. So that way when we're gone, she comes in and wants to get up here. Oh, I can't, there's a placeholder. Or if I want to sit here, I come down, I fold it, and I tuck it under the chair, and then I sit down. When I get up to go to the bathroom, I unfold it, put it here, and then I go to the bathroom. So she runs up, oh, a free space. Oh, darn. You put the white thing up. After a couple months, she'll get out of a habit of doing that. She'll be more relaxed and willing to just kind of hang out. Okay, are you getting settled down, or are you trying to squirm away? I think trying to squirm away. All right, now we live in a split level house, and there's a nice, beautiful window here, and she loves to bark as people come by. Every time she barks at people as they come by, even though they're just passing, in her mind, they're coming to invade the house. But because of her due diligence and her barking, she saved the day. But do our guardians appreciate that? No, they're a bunch of ingrates. They yell at her, or no, they don't yell at her, but they chastise her, they disagree when she does that. Now, if a dog is barking, you yell at him, they just think, cool, now we're both barking. Or look, Hunter agrees with me, he's barking too. So um, it's a rewarding behavior every time, because this gives her the illusion of, of authority because she's so much higher than they are on the street, and she barks at them and eventually they walk away, so she thinks her bark is what made them go away. So what we do instead is we call it maintenance. Just go to get a, a nice piece of paper and put it in the bottom pane of the window. She's, a, she's not a super tall dog, sorry. Um, and this way we don't have to close our blinds, but every time she goes to the window, she can't see outside. Because we're taking away the furniture, she can't sit up here and look over the deal. And after a while, she gets out of the habit of doing it. She hears a sound, she runs up, but she can't see them. So she, she see them, so she doesn't get that validation. And after enough uh, practice, she'll just get out of a habit of uh, doing that, and she'll they'll find other things to do, which we talked about in other parts of the session. Now, another rule is uh, right now she's got a dog door, but she also has some potty issues downstairs. So I'm going to talk about before we go over the door rule. Let's talk about potty training. So a lot of us. Uh, when we bring a dog in and we have an older dog, a lot of times we actually think that we have potty trained or the other the younger dog's potty trained and they're not. They're actually just following the lead of the older dog and having me in the right place at the right time. And I think that's go what's going on here. Because now she's going on wee-wee pads in the basement. And so we had another dog in the picture that unfortunately has passed on. And so now she doesn't have that role model. So what I want the guardian to do is a little bit of remedial potty training. And from remedial potty training, it's super duper easy. Well, we make this a positive experience for you, yes. Um, so what I do is uh, I would come up with a new command word. I just laughed, I saw the dog. cat was outside. Usually cats are trying to get outside, not outside. Um, so basically uh, I say the word business, but you can use any word you want. So you follow the dog outside every, uh, every potty break for about 10, about seven to 10 days. So go outside with her and don't tell her to potty and have a new, like I said, the new word. So let's say we're gonna use the word business, which is the word I use. So we go outside and we give her five minutes to go. If she doesn't go in five minutes, it's not urgent enough for her to need to go. I bring her inside. I would probably either hold her or I would lay on the bed in this, in this guardian scenario and take away the uh, steps so she can't get off the bed on her own. Dogs usually will not defecate or pee where they sleep and she sleeps in the bed. So basically what we do is uh, then we go to uh, lay on the bed uh, for about 15 minutes or until she starts getting persnickety. 
But she starts fussing about, take her outside, give her another five minutes. If she doesn't go in five minutes, we go back up on the bed or I carry her. And we keep doing this back and forth until when I let her out, she urinates or defecates. As soon as she starts to urinate or defecate, in a normal tone of voice, we say the new command word one time and only the command word. Not business, because that will stop her from pottying. So we just say business. So as soon as she gets done, then we lean down and we give her a treat. And we, as soon as the treat goes in her mouth, we say the word business a second time. So the first time associates the action with the command. The second time associates the command with the reward. After enough time, these become synonymous and she will be like, I will dare not waste this urine on a pee pee pad. If I do this outside, I get paid. Now the three times a puppy is mo or a dog is most likely to go is right after waking up, five minutes after the start of playtime and 15 minutes after, uh, five minutes after eating and 15 minutes after the start of heavy playtime. So she starts zooming around the house. Look at your clock, oh, 524. Okay, so 539, I'm gonna take her outside. Having the dog outside the right place at the right time is very beneficial comes to potty training. Now, a lot of people think that you should rub your dog's nose in it or chastise and yell at the dog, say, bad dog, no potty in the house. Both of those things have been clinically proven hundreds and hundreds of time over to make it harder to potty train. Matter of fact, it motivates the dog to not tell you it has to go because you're rubbing its nose and urine. So what it does instead is it finds a place it can hide away from your site. I work in California and uh, there nobody has a yard. One of the most difficult things I have to fix is people who have rubbed their dog's nose in or chastised the dog and the dog just won't pee in front of them anymore. They have to go tie their dog up to a tree and then leave the area because they don't have a yard and will go out of sight before the dog will pee, which is just ridiculous. So because of potty training, it's exclusively positive reinforcement is the only way you're gonna do it. Everything else is gonna backfire and it's gonna make it worse. Good news is it's now only 92 degrees outside. So we, we saved the degree. Okay, so uh, let me see. So uh, going back to the rules, one of the rules I have, right now there's a dog door and a sliding door. I would recommend you pull that out temporarily. You might go back to it next season. But you go to the door and I tell her, sit one time. If she doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk away and I sit down somewhere in the immediate area. Pull out my phone, read a magazine, newspaper, watch a little TV, do whatever you want. She protests, ignore. Now the only time I don't do this rule is if I'm in the throes of potty training. I don't want the dog to say, well, if you're not gonna let me out, I'll just pee over here. So assuming that potty training is taken care of, we go to the door, we tell the dog to do something we want first. And I want you to think of this as like an equation for not only this, but everything else. So your dog wants something. In order for your dog to achieve that something, make them do something to earn it. That boosts the dog's self-esteem and it increases the dog's respect for you as a leader. So basically go to the door and you say, sit. If she doesn't sit, you walk away, sit down for one minute. Then you go back and tell her to sit again. She doesn't sit this time when I walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes. I keep double length of time. But boy, you better know, as soon as her butt hits the ground, I'm gonna fly that door open so fast it'll be like grease lightning. And then, she, and then she gets to go outside. So now the dog's like, oh, Eureka, if I sit down and the door opens, well, she'll just start going and sitting at the door or is her way of saying, I'd like to go outside, please. I started with whatever direction the dog really wants, so probably with her inside going out, but eventually I would do it in both directions. And so now the dog, here, let's put you up here so people can see how cute you are. Yes. Um, eventually the dog will uh, want to do that, will sit at the door and is adopting a desired behavior because that's the way they get what they want. Now the uh, last a couple rules I have is I uh, talked about in the video above this one about enforcing invisible boundary because the dog should not be allowed in the kitchen or preparing food, should not be allowed at the dining room table when we're eating. Also, there's a cat in the house. The cat should be, not be near the dog when the dog's eating. The dog should not be near the cat or the people when they are eating. So that's why the video is there above. Now, I'd recommend that we also go to a structured feeding. Structured feeding, I know, it's so hard to sit here on the couch with a guy in a yellow shirt, isn't it? How about if we give you a little incentive? There we go. So for structured feeding, what we do is we put food in her bowl, but we don't let her eat it. We use the escalating consequences, stepping in between her, and then we put the food on the floor, and, in the bowl on the floor, and then we grab a chip, cracker, something cr crunchy that we can eat. Dogs spend 90% of their time in the wild looking for food. It is the most important activity for them. And when they do find, kill, or capture food, they eat in the order of their rank. If you're a human and you have a dog that doesn't listen to you and you do not eat something before you feed your dog, you're telling your dog it has more rank or authority than you. And that if you tell your dog that, your dog will not listen to you unless it feels like it wants to. So otherwise, now you're the provider of food. Now she wolfs her food down, some dogs are lazy eaters. I usually say, the dog doesn't come within a reasonable period of time, like a minute or so, or they walk away and there's food in the bowl. I pick up the bowl, I dump it empty, 
I put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. Otherwise, they just think you're taking away the food. If you dump it empty, then the food disappeared. And then they don't get fed again until the next meal. I've had dogs go two or three days without eating. You're not saying you can't eat. You're presenting the food and giving the dog multiple opportunities a day at each meal to eat their food. If they choose not to, that's defiance. That is on their tab, not on your tab. It's not ethical to withhold food from a dog. But saying that you have to eat under these criteria is completely fine. Okay, so those are examples of rules. Um, we also talked about structure. Um, and uh, Hunter, who was filming this, went through petting with a purpose. Petting with a purpose is basically the dog comes up and tells you what to do, which she doesn't do because she gets petted so much. But eventually, if her guardian starts withholding, the dog's probably gonna come up and start demand barking, asking for attention. So when she does that, we're gonna give the dog a counter order. Tell the dog to sit. If it's already sitting, it has to lay down or come and sit over here. And if the dog does comply, then we pet it under his chin and we're gonna say the word sit once and only the word sit, not good sit. Then we can pet her as, her as much as or as little as we want. But if she doesn't sit, I'm not gonna pet her at all. I'm only gonna ask it once because if I ask multiple times, I'm essentially begging. And then by her not obeying, she has some authority. She has some leverage over the situation. So instead, I say sit once. If she sits, I pet her under the chin. She gets a reward once to an, one pet to an infinity number of pets. But if she doesn't, nothing happens. We don't need punishment. You're rewarded or nothing happens. After a while, what will happen is she'll start coming in front of you and sitting down to prepay for the attention. When she does this, basically, uh, we want to make sure we do pet that because otherwise she can go back to nudging or barking at us for attention. So when she sits, we pet her on her chin and say sit and then pet as much or as little as we want. Now, uh, that prepay is awesome. That's really, the dog starts thinking, I have to ask the humans versus telling them. Asking is a follower's mindset. Leaders tell. So she tells you or doesn't even have to tell her, and that makes, yes, I agree. That makes her think that she's in charge. So basically, um, after uh, I also have a watchword for this. I had one woman who was petting her dog, and I asked her to stop petting her dog while I explained it. She goes, okay, but I, what's the point of having a dog? I mean, I like petting dogs, it makes me feel good. You're petting your dog, get, I'm sorry. That's all right, just hold off until we get done with it. She goes, okay. But you know, I just got diagnosed with high blood pressure. My doctor said petting the dog, you're petting your dog again. We don't realize how often we pet without a purpose. And so I'm not saying petting your dog is bad, but having your dog earn that affection can really be profound. So when the dog comes up to you, eventually she's gonna come up and just look at you like really cute or whine or whimper or scratch at you. Give her a counter order, tell her to sit, uh, and then pet her. Now, if somebody comes in the room and sees I'm petting her and she's standing, they might come up to me and say paycheck. Paycheck means I suspect you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. And if that's the case, I stop petting her, I tell her to sit or lie down. When she does, I pet her on the chin and say sit. And I tell my partner, actually I asked the dog to sit before you came in the room. When you uh, dropped your book, uh, she stood up and I continued petting. But thanks for reminding me, because I do forget a lot. So even if you want to pet the dog, you're still gonna make her earn it. If you get in a habit of petting with a purpose, every time you pet your dog, it boosts his confidence because it's earning that pet as opposed to being given that pet. Number two, it increases its respect for you as an authority figure because it's not telling you, it's asking. Number three, it helps her practice sitting. Although she can sit great, she probably can't sit great if there's people over or if there's you know, a dog nearby. You have to work your way up to more difficult scenarios and starting in an easier version and, and practicing the sit or the lay down is a great way to go about it. Okay, um, we also talked about passive training. And passive training is really waiting, oh, now we're back to 93 degrees. I don't like your weather thing. Um, passive training is waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior on your own. We don't realize how often when we give a dog a command, it's the end of fun. So we tell the dog to poop, it poops and we come inside. But I was having fun outside. So when I listen to your command, the fun ends. I mean, having a great time yelling at the dog next door. And then you ask me to come because you don't want your neighbors to hear it. And the dog listens to you, comes inside, you close the door, I'm like, well, shoot, I was having a great time telling that black lab off. Why do I have to leave? Listening to you is no fun. Next time, I'm just not going to listen to you. The fun can continue. So for this, uh, to help achieve this, what I do is something called passive training. So passive training is just waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior that you want and rewarding her richly when she does it within that three second window. So right there, I can pet her and say, crash. She just laid down, that's the word I like to use. If she puts her chin here, I might say, ask, because that's the word that we use, we teach service dogs or attention. Uh, pay attention to me, don't have your rage. Um, every time she comes to us, pet her and say, come. Every time she sits, pet her and say, sit. Name all of the toys in the basket right now. She brings her a toy, I mean, those are more of a cat, I'm guessing. Oh, those are the, the deceased uh, puppies stuff. Um, but every time she goes to the dog bed, come up with a name, call it Jamaica. Every time she goes to, Jamaica, you know, to the dog bed, say Jamaica. Well, every time I hear, I mean, the only time I hear Jamaica is when I'm sitting in this comfy bed. Clearly, Jamaica means go to the comfy bed. 
So um, every time your dog comes to you or offers you any desired behavior, make sure you pet them under the chin once to an infinity number of times. Most of us train our dogs to misbehave because it comes to us, we ignore it, it sits in front of us, we ignore it, we lay down, it lays down, we ignore it. But boy, as soon as it starts chewing our carpet or you know, biting the cat or all these other things, we immediately get up over and go over to correct the dog. So it's important that we start showing the dog, these are the things that you can do to make me happy. Most of us do a very poor job of communicating what the dog can do to make us happy, which leaves them in the impression that they need to protect or be possessive of us because we don't listen and they're stressed out just like a parent who finds their children don't listen to them can also get equally stressed. So I think I can, I know that she's stressed because I can see cortisol in her blood. I don't, I see it, but I hear it, but see that little jump that she just made? I just touched her. Well, that's cortisol. That's the stress hormone that amplifies stress. So um, that comes from the dog, like first responders, people in a dangerous situation for too long, develop PTSD. I laughed the first time somebody suggested it, but I did some research and dogs absolutely can have PTSD. And it's usually uh, indicated by you touch the dog and they jump, or they have what we call uh, efficiency of movement. I'm not just looking around the room, I'm snapping my head around. And as you saw, she was doing a little bit of that earlier. So these are all symptoms of the dog thinking that it's in charge, but the humans don't listen to the dog, which stresses the dog even more. And aggression and most behavior problems come from stress. Removing the stress by demonstrating that we are leaders who won't be told what to do, but if you do what we like, we will reward and pay you. And we're not gonna allow you to be on the furniture or in the kitchen or whatever the rule is, so the dog sees you acting like a leader. It'll take about 66 days to form a behavior pattern. So I usually tell my clients that the rules should be in place for a minimum of three months, if not longer. Remember, breaking a rule is not a good way to reward a dog, especially in that 66 day window. It is frustratingly confusing for dogs. So consistency is a great way for dogs to kind of understand it because again, repetition, consistency, and good timing are how they learn. So um, now I have, uh, for the barking, um, I, I, if you go to doggoneproblems.com and click on where it says dog training tips, that's where these videos are, but I have videos for other, a uh, whole bunch of others. Sometime within the last, I, I can't remember the name of the dog because I work with so many, but, and I teach puppy classes, but sometime within the last about 10 sessions, I worked with somebody whose dog also, actually I remember, now see, my brain is a crazy place. There is a pair of Scotties, and actually it's only gonna be a couple below this one. And uh, Olive, was it Olive or Minnie? It was Minnie. You weren't at that one, were you? So um, the, there were two Scotties. Minnie is the white one. She looks like a Westie. I think she's a Westie. You probably think she's a Scotty. Anyways, I go through the counter conditioning exercise I went with you off camera and how to teach a dog to not bark when people move because she had the same exact problem. And so I would invite you to go. It's like Olive and Minnie. It's, it's a black and white uh, little terrier. So just look a couple of below where you're at and watch that video and practice that. Remember, you have a neighbor come by, but the whole point is you have the person far enough away where she doesn't feel the need to react. Once she reacts, she's not gonna hear anything. Um, also for the backyard, does she not come when she's in the backyard? Except for when she has a carcass or something? I'm sorry, what? Does she not come to you when she's when you're in the backyard unless she has like a dead bird or rabbit she, or something? She has got, since we've been keeping her off the furniture, well I have been, um, she has um, listened much, much better. Sadie, come, you know, when she's barking at something, usually the first or second time. I the say, reason I'm asking is if she doesn't come, I have like a technique I can share with you, but I think that- Well, the there rules... are times when she does not. Okay, so for that, what I'd have you do is when she's outside having a good time, go out there, let her go out there for smart, uh, fart around first, and maybe you or your partner can go out, and go out there with one of these uh, high value tricky trainer chicken liver treats. I'm gonna leave the bag here. Yes, I know you want some, we're giving you a whole bunch. Remember to only pet her under the chin. Well, you can pet her anywhere else, just never pet her on top of her head. She's already ducking down. That's a cowering body mechanic, insecure body mechanic. So grab one of these, walk down your stairs and walk about 10 paces into your, however many paces it takes to get in the middle of your, let's say it's just 10. Walk over there and just stand there. Don't call her, don't look at her, don't try to entice her, don't show her the treat. When she comes to you on her own, pop the treat in her mouth, say the word come, then go back inside. Wait about five minutes, go back outside and repeat it. This time instead of going 10 steps in the middle of the yard, go to nine steps and stop and just wait. When she comes to you, give her the treat, say come, go back inside. I promise you, you won't make it to 15 before she just automatically comes to you. But she does give her a treat. Keep doing that one step less each time until eventually you just open the door and she runs to the door because every time you come outside, I'm getting a treat and I get to continue playing afterwards. Most of us get like a treat and then close the door, well then the fun is over. I got a treat, but I want the good times to roll. Well now we're gonna give the best of both worlds. 
And after a while, she'll be inclined to go, want to come to you every time you ask her to because good things happen. Now, I also went over uh, the escalating consequences that we use to disagree. If you forgot what those are, please message me. I'm looking over here because the Guardian's over here right now. But um, since you're going to be watching this at home, if you forget what they are, please call me or text me. Uh, if your notes aren't descriptive enough, I have video where I can share it with you. I also have videos for a whole lot of other things. I want the Guardian to really spend a week, uh, excuse me, a month working on petting with a purpose, passive training, enforcing rules, increasing exercise. After a month, oh, I forgot, there's a puppy that lives next door. So I like you uh, because she nipped at the puppy. Now puppies, it's a, it's a lab puppy, they're boisterous, and she's just not super social with other dogs. We wanna build that in. What I would have you do, talk to your neighbors who's super, super duper nice, and ask them to say, hey, can we just start going for a walk in the evening when you come home? Doesn't have to be a long walk, just around the block. So what you wanna do is have everybody in line. So no retractable leashes, use straight leashes, and keep the leash short. And so we're gonna have human, or a dog, human, human, dog. So because there's a little reactivity, we might have to have some distance. Anytime your dog's reacting, the best thing you do is increase distance. So maybe the lab uh, uh, and the puppy is walking on the little strip of grass on the other side of the sidewalk between the sidewalk and the street, and you're walking on the strip of grass on the, this side of the sidewalk, so we have enough distance. But make sure that you're all in the line that nobody's in front, whoever's in front is the leader. So we're gonna walk around the block. Don't let the dogs interact. Don't let them, you know, they just want to hear each other, see each other, smell each other, but they don't play together. So every day we go on this walk together. It's the same walk and they have that common bonding experience. That can help them get more comfortable with them. Now, first I would have them, you know, have some distance between. Gradually your idea is to get them close and close where eventually it's like, you know, dog, human, human, dog, and we're really close together and the dogs are comfortable with that. Then we could try doing, you know, when the puppy is really tired, that would be a good time to try to help let them meet. Uh, but make sure that she's nice and relaxed about that as well. And I'm hoping when we flip the leader follower dynamic by all the stuff, other stuff we talked about in this video, that she's going to feel less of a threat from the other puppy that I don't have to possess my humans. Now, some dogs do have something called resource guarding, which I don't know if that's the case. I didn't see any indications of it here. I think it's just a straight up jealousy. The dog just wants whoever has her in this case you, and I'm gonna snarl and anybody comes by. So I think that's taking away the furniture is gonna help a great deal with that and you acting like leaders. But in a month or so, if, uh, if you're still having some of those behaviors and you wanna work on them, let me know. We can uh, set it up and bring another dog by and do either some bat training or some counter conditioning or whatever the case may be, or teach her that she doesn't need to protect you. But the more you enforce those rules consistently, as long as everybody in the house is, that's really gonna help. Now, if we do have, I do have some houses where one person's really diligent and the other person a little bit more relaxed, it really slows down the process. So I recommend just really going full butt instead of going half butt, I'm trying to make this G-rated. Um, it, it just really embrace the stuff for about two months. And after two months, you can kind of start backing off the dog kind of on autopilot. Um, and if you have any questions or, or if anything stops working, always back up a half step and practice an easier version and keep on backing up until the dog is successful. We want to build success on top of success. Training dogs and dog behavior is very much a numbers game. You want to practice, have a positive reaction followed by another positive reaction followed another. If you have positive, negative, positive, negative, you're just going to go back and forth like this. You're never going to make much progress. All right. Um, anything else that we want to cover that I didn't cover? It's like I've done this before. Sadie. Now you're all comfy. You, now when I don't have to hold her, of course, we're gonna end the video. So I'm gonna pick you up here so everybody can see how pretty you are. Yes, and she's like, all I wanna do is get away. So let's make another positive reverse. She's like, my mom is right there. She's looking at me. Don't look at her commiserate when she is, uh, when she's not uh, liking things. All right, well, this is Sadie, and these are some, uh, this is Sadie's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. 